Hi everyone and welcome to the Learning Data Live series webinar. I'm Elizabeth Patterson and I will be moderating this presentation today. My colleague Gretel Kinsey will be presenting Extreme Conditions in Data. The Learning Data Live series is brought to you by Scriptorium, the content strategy experts. Since 1997, Scriptorium has helped companies manage, structure, organize, and distribute content in an efficient way. If you're trying to figure out how the data model can best support your content or you're setting up a data system, please contact us and we would love to work with you. LearningData.com and the Learning Data Live series would not be possible without the help from our sponsors, so thank you. Attendees are going to be muted during this webcast, but we still want your input during the session. So type your questions and comments at any time in the questions module and our speaker will answer questions at the end of the session. If you would, go ahead and locate the questions module in the GoToWebinar interface so that you know where that is. Also, be on the lookout during the question and answer portion of the presentation for a link to our evaluation survey and I will drop that in the chat box. Um, we would really appreciate your feedback. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass things off to Gretel. Gretel, are you ready? Yes, I am. All right. You should be presenter. Okay. So, hello everyone and welcome to Extreme Conditions in DITA. Uh, this is, as Elizabeth mentioned, part of Scriptorium's Learning DITA Live series where we offer free web sessions on DITA XML. And in February, we offer a larger event where you get to see a lot of different data presentations, and that is also free. So you can find out more about that on learningdata.com. Today's session is a little bit more tech focused and assumes some prior knowledge of data, particularly around reuse. So I just wanted to mention that before we kick things off. So just a little bit about me before we get started. My name is Gretel Kinsey and I'm a technical consultant with Scriptorium and I've been with the company since 2011. And as Elizabeth mentioned, Scriptorium is focused on content strategy and as a consultant, I focus in particular on developing and deploying content strategies to help companies solve their business problems and achieve their business goals. Uh, about 80% of our client base is using some form of structured content such as XML, and about 80% of those are in DITA. Uh, so I have quite a good bit of experience with DITA tools and technologies, um, as well as content management tools, dynamic delivery portals, authoring tools, DITA open toolkit plugins, uh, basically all kinds of tools and technologies around the use of DITA. I've also done a lot of work on information architecture and content modeling to help prepare companies to convert their content from an unstructured source into a structured form like data. I have been heavily involved in the Learning Data project since its inception. I have done course authoring, course contribution, uh, created supplemental materials for courses, and I've done a lot of these kinds of presentations at various Learning Data Live events. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and dive right into talking about extreme conditions. And a really good place to start with that is to acknowledge that murky conditional requirements are a pretty common thing that you see when it comes to a data environment. So, what exactly are conditions in data and how do they work? We're going to go into a lot more detail about that as we go through the session, but just to start off, in the simplest terms, conditions are a data reuse mechanism for filtering content. So if you want some of your content filtered out for a particular publication based on the audience that it's intended for, you can achieve this in data by using conditions. Uh, this is a really useful mechanism for delivering custom content to different parts of your user base. Uh, when you have the ability to do things like including or excluding certain information based on different aspects of your audience, so for example, what product they own, what their experience level is, what kind of user role they might have, uh, where they're located, what kind of software they might use to access your product, all of those kinds of things. Um, whenever you can deliver information where you exclude or include 
particular things based on those factors, then you can really target the right content at your users so they get a much more personalized content experience. Um, because conditions allow you to reconfigure and repurpose content in different ways, they are considered a type of reuse and data, as I mentioned. Uh, and reuse is a major factor that drives the adoption of data, particularly conditional reuse, as we'll see as we go further into this. Um, so some examples of that, a company might start looking into DITA once their requirements get too complex for some of the kind of basic conditions that you might get in uh, you know, a desktop publishing system. So for example, if you're working in something like FrameMaker or InDesign or Word, um, a lot of times all you can do with conditional text is just basic show and hide. Um, you can't really get too complex with it like you can in something like DITA. Um, maybe you've got another example where a company knows that they have a need for reuse. Um, they're aware that not all reuse is the same. And so they look at conditions as one of the potential reuse mechanisms that can help them achieve some of their goals, um, especially as it uh, regards filtering, targeted delivery, custom delivery. If they know that that's a reuse requirement, then that's something that might get them to say, hey, let's look at conditions and see what that can do for us in DITA. Um, maybe you've got a situation where a company is already doing some reuse in an unstructured workflow, but uh, they're limited, they can only do so much. And once they've kind of hit the limit of what they can do and they need something more complex, then uh, that complexity can really become a lot of a headache if you're trying to bend an unstructured workflow to make that happen and to accommodate that. So that's where they might also say, uh, you know, maybe we should look into adopting DITA and making use of those DITA conditions. So these are just a few different scenarios that, um, you know, talk about the requirements around reuse and conditions in particular. Um, and a lot of times, if you think about those sorts of examples, those requirements can be really unclear or not very well defined. Um, so before doing something like adopting DITA and deciding how you might want to set up your reuse mechanisms, it's really important to clarify those requirements. Think about what you really need and how you can make the most out of using conditions. If you're familiar with setting up text variants in an unstructured or desktop publishing based type of content environment, then you've probably seen these two ways of accomplishing that, which are variables and conditions. Um, and I want to talk about the difference between these two things and really highlight that. So we're going to look at this in quite a bit more depth. Um, but just to start off, variables are a short snippet, such as the name of a product or feature or app that might need to change over time as you develop new products or maybe you redo your branding, that sort of thing. DITA does not have variables per se, but instead DITA uses key references to accomplish something very similar. And so we're going to take a look at exactly how that works a little bit later. Um, this is a different reuse mechanism from conditions, which are primarily used, as I mentioned, for filtering. So conditions are when you've got information that needs to be included or excluded from your final publication, as opposed to just something like a name that might change. And you can conditionalize content at the topic level, the block level, or the inline level. And this can include objects such as graphics or tables. Conditions and DITA must match up to an element equivalent. So that's different from an unstructured tool where conditions are kind of a separate layer of your content. In DITA, you conditionalize at the element level. Um, and so again, we'll take a look at exactly how that works in more detail. There are a lot of different dimensions for which you might need conditions, um, and those include output types. So for example, PDF, HTML, EPUB, whatever delivery format or formats your content is in. Product is another one. This can be a specific product or product line. Uh, maybe it also could refer to product feature. It depends on how you sort of organize the way that you name and produce your products. Audience level is one. You can group your audience in different ways. So maybe uh, you know, for something like audience level, you'd want to categorize them by their level of experience, beginner, intermediate, advanced, that sort of thing. Customer type, uh, this might refer to something like the user role that the customer has based on how they interact with your product. 
um, customer itself could just be, uh, you know, different company names of customers that engage with you. It could be different groups or subcategories of your customers. So there are a lot of different ways that you can, uh, you know, conditionalize your content across these different dimensions. You might end up having some dimensions that are very specific to your company and your product and not, uh, you know, kind of more general like these. Uh, you also might have scenarios where these dimensions intersect or overlap. So, for example, maybe only users who have purchased a certain product get to see the content that documents that product's features. And then within that, maybe you want to filter even further based on the user's role or location or whatever. So this kind of complexity in conditions across multiple dimensions is nearly impossible to achieve with the sort of more traditional unstructured desktop publishing tools but it's absolutely possible in DITA, and in many cases, it can often be quite straightforward. Uh, DITA is built to handle that kind of complexity. So a little bit earlier, we touched on variables, and uh, I wanna go into that in a little bit more detail. So as I said, there aren't really variables in DITA, but there are key references or key refs, and that basically accomplishes the same thing. So how exactly does that work? Let's take a look at a little bit of a code sample and, and see how this can be set up. So for key references, you use a placeholder in the text and then you use your map file to define that placeholder. So if we take a look at this code sample, we have up top our map and in this map, we have a key definition for client name. So we've defined that client name as my first client in the keyword element. And then if we look down at that uh, topic code sample at the bottom, we put a key reference to that client name in our topic. So whenever we publish output, we will see the words, my first client right there where that key ref is. Um, basically publishing is what's going to resolve this key ref. There are also some uh, you know, smart data authoring tools, editors, content management systems that can show you that resolution as you're authoring. Um, but in general, across the board, that gets resolved when you publish. So what this means is that you can have a single topic with a key ref and multiple map files with that key definition that result in different outputs for that key reference. Um, so for example, you might have this same topic, uh, you know, in another map where you have defined that uh, key for client name as my second client instead of my first client. And so then if you publish that map, all of the key refs in your topic that, uh, you know, make a reference to client name will then display my second client. So if you have one document that you need to deliver to my first client, then you would uh, you know, put that topic in the first map and generate it based on that. And then if you need to deliver a document to my second client, uh, you know, same thing, put that topic in that map. And basically all of these different places where you have defined your keys in a map, you just uh, you know, reference that topic in each map and then generate the output you need for the specific audience. So that lets you write a topic one time and then anywhere in that topic where you have a proper noun or a name that might change. So client names like we see here, it could also be product names, uh, maybe it's company name, anything related to your branding. Um, all of that can be set up as keys in your topic. Um, and then you can publish different versions of that topic against a different map with a different key definition, depending on which map that you use and which audience that you're delivering for. Um, this is something we have seen a lot of our clients do with things like policy documentation, product documentation, anything that might have these small pieces of variable information, uh, you know, these kind of uh, proper nouns, proper names. And Scriptorium actually does this um, for things like proposals or contracts. We actually set up uh, client names in exactly this way as keys. And doing this not only helps with reuse, but it also ensures that you only have to type that name one time and then it's correct everywhere that it's referenced. So it really helps with consistency. Um, it eliminates that possibility of human error where you might spell a client's name wrong if you just have it one time 
in that key definition, then you know it's going to be right everywhere that that's referenced. So it's a, a really useful way to avoid that human error. Uh, so now that we have talked about how keys work for variables, how does that differ from conditions? So now let's dive into some of the basics and look at some code samples for how we would set up conditional information in DITA. So here is our sample for uh, you know, just basically setting up a condition. Um, you assign attributes to an element to make it conditional. And therefore, you can assign conditions to anything that has an element because you can put attributes on all these different elements. And that can be all the way down to phrases, words, or even letters, although uh, we definitely caution against that. Uh, so if you look at this example here, you can see that we have up top a paragraph level condition where the audience attribute is applied to that P element. So we've got P audience equals advanced. Um, and because this is marked with audience equals advanced, that tells us that this paragraph is for an advanced audience. And therefore, if we are publishing a document for beginner level users, then we would want to filter that paragraph out. And then if we look down at our uh, other example down here where it says inline. This example is a note element where there's a platform attribute that's been applied uh, just at the phrase level around a little piece of this text. And note what we've actually said here in this example, that it's possible to do conditional content at the phrase level, but it's a really terrible idea. And that's because it uh, introduces a ton of potential problems around localization. So that's why we always issue this warning about conditions. Do not use conditions below the sentence, preferably paragraph level. Um, this is, you know, like I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, even though DITA does allow you to, uh, you know, basically wrap a word or a, a phrase from a sentence or even a letter in a phrase element and apply an attribute to that, it's a really, really bad idea for localization. Um, and that's just because if you have conditionalized part of your sentence, then that might not work when you go to translate your content. Uh, not every language has the same kind of sentence structure as your source language. So if you're writing in English uh, and then you translate to another language where the sentence structure is completely different, if you have set off a part of that sentence and made it conditional, then things are just completely not going to work when you try to translate. So whenever you're setting up conditions, it's best to do so at the bare minimum at the sentence level, um, but we really encourage the full paragraph level even more just to be safe in case there is, uh, you know, maybe context from one sentence to the next. Uh, it's really best to, uh, you know, kind of think of a whole block of content, whether it's a paragraph, a note, uh, yeah, a table, list item, something like that. It's it's better to think of you know kind of whole units when it comes to conditions, and uh, and not set up conditions at something like the phrase level where you've got just a partial sentence. And just to illustrate this in kind of a humorous way, please, for the love of all that is holy, no, do not do something like this. Um, I mostly just included this as a joke, but it really is a word of caution because something like this is pretty much a translator's worst nightmare, right? Um, so in this example, we, we've kind of got, uh, you know, basically the, the letters in these different words conditionalized um, for the different spellings for UK versus uh, US English. And so, yeah, there are definitely much better ways to set up conditional content for different locations, this is absolutely not the way to do it. This is just going to introduce way more localization nightmares than it could ever solve. So here's another look at how we might set up a couple of different paragraphs with different conditions and how we might do that properly. Um, and this shows us some examples of how conditions might overlap or intersect. So based on the attributes that we've defined, we can see that this first paragraph here is for expert users on Windows machines who have purchased product X. And we see that uh, because we have audience equals expert, platform equals Windows, product equals X. Um, so any user that, uh, you know, their, their particular, um, you know, use case fulfills all of those different requirements would get that piece of content. 
Um, and then if we look at the second paragraph, we see um, some basically the same uh, attributes defined but with different values. So we've got audience equals expert again. This time for platform, we have Windows and Mac. And for product, we have X, Y, and Z. So what this tells us is that the second paragraph applies to any users who are experts who are on Windows or Mac and who have purchased products X, Y, or Z. Uh, so what this kind of illustrates is that users can get different content included or excluded from their documentation depending on their user level, their platform, and their product. And uh, even if you've got different combinations, so let's say a piece of content applies to both Windows and Mac or to all three products, X, Y, and Z, you can set it up that way, make sure it's tagged that way in your attributes and values. And then that way, when you go to filter, um, you already have it defined that yes, this content applies kind of across the board to expert users with all of these uh, different factors for platform and product. So this really lets you deliver, deliver personalized and targeted content that is tailored to the customer more specifically. Um, something like this, where you've got these, uh, you know, kind of different levels of complexity and these different, uh, you know, kind of layers of overlap or intersection would be practically impossible to do in an unstructured environment. But with DITA, as you can see, it's, it's quite straightforward. So I want to talk about the DITAVAL file now because this is what makes condition-based filtering possible. A DITAVAL file defines which elements to include or exclude based on those attributes and values that we've set up and defined in the elements. So when you write your content, the topic itself will have the different elements and you'll have those attributes and values put on them for conditions and then the didaval file will actually specify okay here's what we do with each of those um, those attributes that we've defined so if we look at this particular example of a didaval a didaval file we see that we are including content for expert users who own product x um, and that's because we've got this one, the first prop action for include um, for the attribute of audience and the value of expert, we have said we are including that. And then for our second prop action, we are also including for the attribute product and the value X. So what this tells us is, uh, you know, if you are an audience member of expert level and if you own product X, then content in this publication for those two things will be included. And you can also do exclude, you can do any combination, you can have multiple different DITAVAL files that you can uh, use to produce different outputs. And what happens is that when you publish your content, you uh, generate your output against the relevant DITAVAL file for that deliverable. So that's what allows you to have all of these different custom pieces of content for different conditional dimensions. So uh, basically all you need is one didaval file for each uh, you know, kind of permutation of your content or each different del deliverable. And then you just use that when you generate your output. So uh, you know, based on some of the factors we've got here, maybe you have a user manual that is uh, for your expert users. And then within that, you've got a different, you know, maybe you've got a user manual for your Windows users who are experts. Maybe you've got one for your Mac users who are experts. There would be a different didaval file for each of those different publications so that you can generate each one for each different segment of your audience. Uh, when it comes to conditions, the DITA markup for conditions is the smaller challenge. And I say smaller because it's not small, um, but it's also not the hardest part of setting up conditions. Taxonomy and information architecture are much more difficult. This is where you have a lot of decisions to make. Uh, so some of the things that you might ask are, which attributes do you need to achieve the conditional processing that you're looking for? What values should each of those attributes have? Um, how do all of your different attributes combine? How do they intersect? How do they overlap? Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more later on, on why it's so important to have all of this set up. 
but this is really what it takes to start planning for the use of conditions, is thinking about all of these questions, coming up with the right answers. Uh, uh, DITA only offers a few attributes by default out of the box, um, and then you must specialize. So um, you assign attributes to an element to make it conditional, and you can assign conditions, therefore, to anything that has an element, all the way down to phrases, words, et cetera. Um, but because there are only those few attributes available out of the box, you're sort of limited in what you can do if those don't work for you. Um, so out of the box, you have audience, platform, and product, which we've already seen in our previous examples. Um, you also have rev or revision level. You have other props, uh, which is just other properties. It's kind of a catch-all attribute for metadata. And you have props, which is a generic attribute for conditional processing. Uh, if you have any needs beyond those uh, particular attributes that it offers by default, that's when you have to specialize. Um, and some companies do need really specific attributes based on their products and their customer base. So that's when they might choose to go the route of specialization. Um, others might look at the out-of-the-box attributes that are offered in DITA and they say, okay, we can make our conditional processing work with the ones that already exist and we don't need to specialize. Whichever approach that you take, it's important to really plan carefully up front so that you don't run into a scenario where maybe you say, oh no, we should have specialized differently several years down the road after they are already you know, a few locked yourself into certain specialized attributes, um, that's where you would say, oh, we should have planned for this better. Um, another thing to note is that you can use data to limit the attribute values that are allowed. Uh, that can be done via your authoring tool or a subject scheme map. Um, some authoring tools offer different options for controlling the display of those values. Um, and a subject scheme map also lets you you set up a controlled list of values for each attribute. Um, and that also can include a hierarchy of values. So you can have, you know, sort of your attribute and then the values have subcategories. And what's nice about this is that um, you can limit the values that can be allowed in those attributes. It can really help improve consistency and it can make things easier for your authors because instead of uh, you know having to type in a value for that attribute and risk uh, you know putting in the wrong thing or you know just having 800 different things because people can freeform type in if you have a controlled list of values then they can just pick what one they want from a list instead of typing it in and that really helps uh, take control of the way that you are putting conditions in place so now that we've gone through the basics of how conditions work, let's get a little bit more complex. Um, and when it comes to complex conditions, I want to really address what happens when you combine them. We started touching on this a little bit when we talked about areas where they might overlap or intersect. Um, and DITA does make it possible and it makes it pretty straightforward and it's not that hard to do in theory, but it does tend to make your head hurt when you're trying to just wrap your brain around all the different layers of conditions and how they work. And this is something that we've run into with several of our clients. Um, there are a lot of cases where a company would have a need for multiple layers or levels of conditions, um, maybe different dependencies among different conditions. And setting that up can be a lot to wrap your brain around. Uh, so let's take a look at some examples of how that might work. Um, and we're going to start simple. So here is a warning where you have included content for the state of California, and that's indicated by warning having that attribute of audience equals CA for California. But wait, what about Canada? That can also be abbreviated as CA, just like California. So then you create two different audience values. Um, maybe you've got USA hyphen CA for California, and then you've just got CA by itself for Canada. Oh wait, but Canada has customers who speak both English and French. So then maybe in that case, we add a distinction to our audience value for Canada of 
CAFR to specify this is for French speaking Canadian audience. And now when we've done this, we're mixing our metaphors because if you look at that first audience attribute and its value, you have USA, CA, so you have country state. Um, then if you look at the second one of CAFR for Canada French, you've got country language instead of country state. So then you say, okay, well, maybe we try something else different. Um, and maybe instead of including the language as part of that audience attribute value, maybe we add an XML lang attribute to the warning and specify the French language there. Uh, so let's take a look at how different customers might add to this kind of complexity around the audience attribute. Uh, let's say we've got a customer who's in the army. That's fine. We're going to just do audience equals army. And then we add the Navy. That's still fine. Then maybe we've got some content that's shared by both. So we do audience equals army, Navy. So any content in there is uh, shared by, by both of these different military branches. And then maybe we start factoring in other branches of the military and suddenly all of the values you've got for audience start to get pretty unwieldy. Um, and this is even more so if you are you know, maybe looking at something besides audience, if you're looking at product and you've got 50 different product names, this can get really out of control very quickly. So if we keep looking at this example, um, what happens if you have a non-US military customer? The taxonomy that we had started setting up is not equipped to deal with uh, additional customers who are in the military but not in the U.S. military. But then let's say you've set that up and then you get a non-U.S. military customer or maybe more than one. So now what do you do? This is one of those things where you would go, oh no, we should have thought of this ahead of time. Why didn't we plan? Um, so that's where it really illustrates this point of you know, planning your taxonomy before you start to lay it out. So maybe in this scenario, you just start adding values that look something like this, um, where you specify military, then country, then branch. Um, so in these two examples, you've got military U.S. Army and military U.K. Army. But what would have been even better and more flexible and given you more semantic value is something like this. Um, so instead of just having all of this information in the value for your audience attribute, you had different attributes for each piece. So segment for military, branch for army, and country uh, for US or UK. Um, and as you can see, the key here is to understand what requirements that you have ahead of time, because uh, making a change like this would be very, very painful, especially when you note that instead of using the audience attribute, which is one of the standard ones that comes with it out of the box, this new method where you've separated everything out into segment, branch, and country, um, those do not come out of, out of the box, so those would have to be specialized. So if you think there's ever going to be a case for specialization, that's something that you would want to plan for and think about really hard when you are setting this up. Um, otherwise, you could end up in a situation where you're sort of locked into shoving content into values for an attribute like audience in a way that doesn't really work and then you're just you know kind of out of luck right you um you're in a situation where, where if you've chosen not to specialize or you have been told that you don't have a budget for specialization because you didn't plan and you didn't make a case for it now you're in a scenario where you just have to use those default uh, attributes like audience or platform or product and kind of make the values work. And then they can be really difficult to manage and not give you anywhere near the semantic value that you would have if you had been able to specialize. So that just gets back to the point I made earlier about how taxonomy and information architecture and planning are the most challenging parts of this process. And in a lot of ways, they're the most crucial. So definitely spend as much time as you can on those requirements and on requirements gathering before you even start to build out your taxonomy. And whenever you do define the taxonomy, be really thoughtful in those decisions. Um, don't just think about what works for you now, but if you already have 
requirements that you know will come down the pipeline in the future, go ahead and plan for that as well. Um, gather your requirements from anywhere that you need to across the entire organization so that you can make sure the taxonomy supports all the conditional processing that you need, not just in your department, but in any other departments where your content might intersect or where you might need to share content. And that way you can make sure that you can support any conditional processing that you need down the road and not run into situations like this where then you have to come up with workarounds. So let's keep getting even more extreme with our conditions and let's talk about now the intersection of conditions with other types of data reuse. So CONREFs are a big one and CONREFs are a reuse mechanism that lets you reuse information um, by referencing it in. So this can be applied to topics, paragraphs, lists, notes, images, tables, whatever uh, element that you want. Um, but what if you've got a scenario where you want to reuse a topic uh, and you want some pieces of content changed or added or deleted? This is something you can achieve by embedding conditionals inside of the reusable object. Um, or you can do something else. You can use something really funky called CONREF push. Um, and that's a really advanced mechanism for reuse, but it can be extremely useful. So let's take a look at how that works. Let's say that you have two different deliverables for two different clients, and they each need to have a different paragraph after this first paragraph, um, and that needs to be specific to their needs. So both of them get this first paragraph about uh, our recommendations for FrameMaker, but uh, client A needs to have this first paragraph here um, where you know, below that one you've got using FrameMaker would eliminate the manual formatting and then the other client needs this other paragraph. FrameMaker does not support right to left languages. So how do we make this happen? This is where you could use CONREF push and have one topic that has that first paragraph that appears in both um, and then you could just push that subsequent paragraph in where you need it. So let's take a look at some code and see exactly how that would work. So up at the top we have our source topic and that's where we've got that paragraph that would appear in both the publications for client A and client B. And then what we've got below that for client A we want to push in this paragraph about how using FrameMaker would eliminate manual formatting. Uh, that's what's relevant to that client. And then for client B, we want to push in this other paragraph about how FrameMaker doesn't support right to left languages because that's what's relevant for them. So we set up the CONREF push mechanism as shown here. Uh, first, we use a CONREF to specify the paragraph that we're going to be pushing these other paragraphs after. And then we use the CON action attribute defined as push after to do just that. So what happens as a result of this is that client A and client B will get different versions of the content. They'll get that same topic, but client A will have this additional paragraph um, about how using FrameMaker would eliminate manual formatting, and client B will have that additional paragraph about how FrameMaker does not support right to left languages, and that allows you to reuse your main topic, but then just have these other paragraphs pushed in. I want to take a little bit of time and talk about the human element in all of this. Um, DITA offers a lot of flexibility with regard to conditional processing, but it relies on humans to set everything up in the most optimal way to maximize that potential. And because we're humans, that means that the way you set things up might not be perfect, right? Um, so your conditional processing might require some time, some testing, um, lots of different iterations to make sure that it all works the way you've planned. And this is especially true the more layers of complexity that you have to your conditions. Uh, you know, the more different attributes and values that you have, the more combinations and permutations that you have. If you've got dependencies, if you've got overlaps, um, all of that adds complexity and that in turn requires more testing, more planning, more configuration to make sure it's all going to work because since we are imperfect humans, we probably won't get it right on the first try. Um, and 
even aside from that, you may also need to make some updates to the way that you've set up conditional processing over time as things change. Um, sometimes this might be as straightforward as updating your attribute value lists. So if you've got new products, new features, that sort of thing, then you may need to add those to your list of values and eliminate some old ones. Um, maybe it's something like you start delivering content uh, and products to new customer bases that are in different locations. Um, and in that case, uh, you know, you would have to add uh, potentially not just new values, but also new attributes to support some of those. Maybe you've got a situation where there's a complete overhaul of your entire product line because there's a merger or a rebranding effort or acquisition or some other organizational change that's outside of your control. Um, whenever something like that happens, it is very painful, but at least if you've already set up conditional processing and it was working well before, then you'll at least have sort of a roadmap or some lessons that you learned from that first round of working with conditions. And then you can take that and say, okay, Yes, we've completely, you know, redone everything. Uh, you know, we've got a whole new line of products now, and maybe we don't have the right content to support it. But we were doing this before, and it worked. And here's how it worked. And then that can sort of give you your guidelines for putting conditional processing in place with sort of an entirely new set of content. Um, the human element can also come into play with your attribute values, and this gets back to what I was saying a little bit earlier about having a controlled list of those values. Um, whether you have a controlled list uh, through something like subject scheme or your authoring tool interface or something else, um, it, it's really important to think about that, how you're going to maintain and control those values. Um, because you don't want to introduce that human error and you don't want a scenario where you're having to manage um, you know, something where you have users that can just freeform put in whatever attribute values that they want. If you have specific ways that you want to control it and that you're filtering around those values, then it's important to think about, okay, how do we define them and how do we govern the use of them? Sometimes when the scope of your work outweighs what humans are capable of managing, then it might be time to reevaluate how you are handling conditional processing. Um, so for example, if you are managing a lot of conditional processing, um, you've got maybe tons of different layers of attributes and values, and you have lots and lots of different DataVal files for these uh, you know, different publications, these different versions that you send out. Um, that can get really, really unwieldy and difficult to manage. And um, the more layers of complexity that are involved, it can also get confusing for people to author and publish and manage. So if you're in that kind of situation where, um, you know, maybe you're delivering, you know, 50 or 100 different variants of your content to these different personalized segments of your audience, and it's becoming really difficult to manage all those conditions and, uh, and all those DataVal files, that may be the ideal time to look into other technology that can support what you're trying to do. So for example, you might look into a dynamic delivery portable, portal for targeted custom content. Um, something that can deliver personalized and targeted content on the fly based on something like a user profile or user specifications. So that way you don't have to keep uh, managing and tracking and maintaining all of those conditions and DataVals yourself. Uh, so just to wrap up with some tips about surviving extreme conditions, the most important one is to just keep in mind that DITA can do way more than humans, um, but that human element will always play a vital role in how your conditional processing is set up. Um, however, once that's in place, DITA can do all that work for you, so you don't have to think about it the way that you would in an unstructured environment. You can have a lot more complexity, you can have a lot more flexibility, and you can really do a lot more to, uh, you know, kind of have these more extreme conditions and these uh, scenarios that let you do whatever you need to to serve your audience.
Um, you don't have to be limited in the way that you use conditions with DITA the way that you would in um, an unstructured desktop publishing environment. Even if your requirements are very complex, DITA has the mechanisms in place to handle them through conditional processing, as you've just seen. So uh, bottom line, when it comes to surviving extreme conditions, don't worry, DITA can handle it. And with that, I want to open things up for questions. Thanks so much, Gretel. Um, I, uh, we're going to go through questions now. So if you have any questions and you haven't already dropped them in the questions module, you can go ahead and do that now. Um, Gretel, I'll go ahead and start with one that I have. Sure. If you are working on multiple documents that require different keywords, is it easy to switch back and forth between keys? Um, yes, so if it, it's just to make sure I understand what you're saying. Um, if you want to um, have different uh, information show up where that key is, all that you have to do to switch is just publish that topic in a different map. So that's what's really so great about keys is that if you have, um, let's say, one document and you've got um, a key definition for product name set up. And so, you know, every few paragraphs or so, it mentions the name of this product. If you want to publish that document for product A, then you reference that topic in a map for product A where you've defined, you know, maybe product A has a specific name and that that name will appear everywhere when you publish. And then if you want to just do the same one for product B, then you would just reference that topic in the map for product B. So really, um, you know, switching out that information is just as simple as having that topic referenced in a different map where those different keys are defined. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, another question, why would you place include in a Didaval file? Isn't include the default? Um, it is, but there are certain scenarios where um, you may want to explicitly say include this piece of information, exclude this piece of information. Um, but yes, typically include works as a default and you would want to exclude certain things. Um, and it, it really, this kind of gets back to a matter of how you have set everything up um, and, and whether you've kind of set up everything where you've got all of your content in one place and then you're just taking pieces out. Um, and that's kind of the, like the question says, the typical way that we see things done. Um, but if you've got your content set up maybe in a different way where not everything is contained sort of at the, the root level, then that's where something like include might be more useful. Okay, thank you. Um, so you said earlier in the presentation that it was possible to do conditional content at the phrase level, but it has the potential to cause problems around localization. What kinds of problems might this cause? Um, so if you have conditionalized just a phrase, let's say that you conditionalize um, a part of your sentence and then you go to translate, um, they, there might be differences in the sentence structure from one language to another where the piece that you've conditionalized doesn't make sense. Um, and so, for example, let's say in the other language, um, you know, if you have just this one piece that is uh, switched out from you know one piece of condi conditional information to another between publications, the translator might have looked at that entire sentence and translated it in a different way, um, and they might get stuck and say it's impossible to translate when only a piece of it is conditional. Um, and you can even run into issues just with your source language only. So, for example, if you are um, if you are conditionalizing a phrase within your sentence um, or a word even, and then um, you know you have something like singular or plural or subject verb agreement where you um, you know are switching out that piece of conditional information, that can cause a lot of problems too. Um, and that's why when it comes to using keys we recommend that that's only done for something like a product name or a company name, basically a proper noun that is going to be the same no matter what and may not even get translated out of the source language because it's, uh, you know, it's, it's branding. Um, if you 
are um, you know just translating a sentence or even doing a sentence in English where you are switching out just a piece of text for different audiences, you can very easily run into issues with grammar and agreement in your source language and then in your target languages for translation you can run into all kinds of even bigger problems so that's why we recommend that you kind of at the bare minimum just conditionalize at the sentence level even more so it's better at the paragraph level because that allows the translator to kind of look at that whole piece of information in context and translate it however it needs to be translated um, as opposed to trying to deal with the nightmare that is translating little bits and pieces of sentences and hoping that they'll fit together properly when you generate your outputs. And that would be also really expensive if you were expecting a, uh, a translator to kind of help you check that and make sure that it works. So that's really why we encourage you to only conditionalize uh, sentence level or larger pieces of content. Okay, great. Um, and I have one more here that just came through. Um, okay. Is it recommended to apply conditionals to audience specific elements? For example, instructor note would only apply to instructors, not students. Should a condition still be applied to this element? Yeah, that's absolutely a great use case for conditions. Um, and, and that's actually something that we have seen, um, uh, I think for this example would be for training content if you've got instructor notes. Um, we've worked with some companies that produce training content or educational content, and we actually produce that on learningdata.com itself. Those courses are all in data with the learning and training specialization. Um, and that's an excellent use case for, um, you know, maybe having one document where the instructor notes are in place. Um, maybe an, another use case in that same vein would be if you have um, a key version of a test versus the, t the test that the students get. Uh, and one, of course, has all of the answers on it and the other one is blank um, in those answer places. So that's another really good place where you would conditionalize and you would say, um, you know, only show these answers whenever you have audience equals teacher and then hide them all when you have audience equals student. Um, so that's that's absolutely a, a spot on use case for conditions. Okay, great. Well, it looks like uh, we are out of questions. So if anyone has any additional questions, um, you can go ahead and drop them into the questions module now. Um, and we can get those answered. You can also send questions to experts at learningdata.com and I just dropped that email address in the chat box. Um, so you can email us with any additional questions after the webinar is over and we will definitely follow up with you. I also just dropped the link to the survey evalu or the evaluation survey into the chat box. So if you can take a few minutes to fill that out, we would really appreciate your feedback. Um, and Gretel, I don't see any more questions, so I believe this concludes our webinar. Uh, thank you for joining us for this Learning Data Live series presentation. Be sure to follow us at Learning Data and at Scriptorium on Twitter for updates on our next Learning Data Live series event. If you haven't already, register for Learning Data Live 2020, which takes place February 10th through 12th. Registration is open now on learningdata.com, and there are also registration links going out on Twitter. Thank you so much, everyone, and thank you, Gretel. Thank you.